Han Yi is so impressed that Kevin made this effort and then conducts himself well during the information interview that he left his informational interview. He left there, met the, just met the guy. He left there with a paid internship, a summer internship. Um, it's just amazing stuff. Can you imagine what it was like for Kevin to drive home and call his mom and dad and say, I just landed a paid internship with the agent for Tom Brady? All right, um, welcome to The Hacked Life. I'm here with my guest, Sean O'Keefe, long-term uh, friend. And, uh, you know, one of the things on The Hacked Life, what I like to bring the audience is different hacks. But it's not just hacks because I think you need mastery. I think there's a component of mastery that's important. And, you know, part of the show is just, it's influenced by health, fitness, nutrition, biohacking, wellness. But one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you is I want to interview high performers, people that are performing at a peak level. And when it comes to happiness in people's lives, I think having their dream job and being successful and that aspect of their life is critical. It's huge. It's hugely important, right? And if that component's not satisfied, then you're not going to be a high performer. Then that's going to be some influence in health in your life. And I think you really do an excellent job in this area. And so that's why I wanted to have you on. Um, yeah. So say hello and uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background. Great to be here. And uh, I mean, this is, this is such a great experience. Uh, Joel mentioned we go way, way back. I mean, we go back to when we were young kids in our parents' garage wrestling at holidays, um, getting angry with one another, and um, sometimes, you know, very frustrated with one another. Um, and we grew a friendship over the years, through our teenage years, through our college years, through our 20s and 30s. And um, it's re been really great to uh, see that friendship progress. So uh, really honored to be on your, on your show here today. And um, let's get right into it. All right. So when I think about you, I always talk a lot about salesmanship. And, uh, you know, it's funny because you got me hired my first sales job. Actually, I was selling Cutco knives. I think I was 18 years old and you got me on board. And uh, it was originally you that you were working at Cutco, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long were you? How long did you work there? Do you remember? Yeah. So I, I did that all three years. Well, I did it three years in college. Um, from the time I was 18, it was, <laughs> I started my college at um, a local community college. And one day I was walking out of class and I get to my car and there's a flyer on my car that says $14 and 10 cents an hour, flexible schedule. What year was this? Do you remember? 1998. <laughs> so $14 and 10 cents. I mean, my friends are making like five twenty five, dollars um, working whatever the jobs that they could find. And um, actually my dad was the first person in the family to go to college, wow. uh, um, in his family to go to college. And he wanted nothing more for my sister and I, um, to get into four year schools. Um, because he went to community college and worked three or four jobs at a time. He transferred to a four year school and graduated, but he, he had to pay for his college. So he had to work three or four jobs. So he never actually had any fun because it was either, mm -hmm. it was working the th three or four jobs plus going to school. So when he reflected on his college experience, he wanted my sister and I to be able to get the full college experience. And so when I ended up at a community college, um, in retrospect, I learned that he was slightly disappointed in that. And so one of the things that he told me was that he didn't need me to get, um, have a job. He just wanted me to get good grades and transfer to a four-year school. <laughs> but then I'm sitting there and you know, <laughs> I'm seeing fourteen dollars and ten cents an hour flexible schedule. My dad was also a hippie and he went to Berkeley Berkeley in the seventies and he always gave this message to my sister and I about like have an open mind. And so I'm I'm thinking about that, like have an open mind, fourteen dollars and ten cents an hour. And so Were um, you really having an open mind or were you just thinking this is a lot of money? <laughs> uh well I, both. I mean uh, well, the first thing is, you, you mentioned the job was selling kitchen knives. They don't tell you that on the phone. So when you call right. up and you see this flyer, um, they just book you for an interview, and they're very strategic about what they say. So I showed up for the interview, and um, I'm so um, not observant that um, 
I didn't even know after the first interview that it was selling knives. And I booked myself for three days of training, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, but all I knew that the guy who was going to be my manager, he was somewhat young. Um, he drove a really nice Lexus. He was articulate and he was good looking. And I thought, I could probably learn something from this guy. And if I'm making $14.10 an hour, might as well take the job. And um, so I did. And then, I mean, I had pimples all over my face at this time. And um, I was so bad when I started this job. I'm, I'm, I'm reading the manual and I'm looking up. And the good news is, as you know, that the products are good and they sell it. Long story short, I made $10,000 a summer for three summers. I mean, this is back in 90, 1990. Nine, two thousand, two thousand summers in two thousand one, and um, that's only working part time. Working part time, yeah. So it turned out to be a great thing. Uh, I want to go back to something you said in the intro. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I take pride in, and the fact that I get to teach as a professor, which is still blows my mind. I'm probably one of the, one of the most unlikely professors there are, um, and it, it is still even is weird to hear myself say the word professor for for me, um, but. Teaching at a Jesuit university is great because we really embrace the holistic education, meaning that we can bring in all aspects of life into whatever class we're teaching. So even though I teach a class on biz effective business communication, um, I always start every quarter about talking about the seven pillars of life. And in my mind, mm -hmm. that's family and friends. It's your career. It's spirituality. It's health. It's your contribution to society. Um, it's lifestyle. And it's education. And then when you're done with your education, it's personal development. And are these um, the seven pillars that you created, or is this like seven pillars from Stephen Covey's? No, books? this is just my remember. own. I mean, maybe someone else out there has the same seven pillar. But and, and you know, I tell my students they don't have to adopt mine. They could have three. They can have eleven. But in, in my view of the world, if you know, the, a lot of people do goal setting, and I'm big on goal setting. So you know, my wife and I every year, and um, we set goals, and we set not only yearly goals but monthly goals. And so when I think about you know, winning the game of life. So I have this private LinkedIn group um, and um, it, the name of it is win the game of life. And when I think about what it means to win the game of life, you know, as someone who comes from, you know, has a competitive nature, whatever I'm doing, I want to try and win. And so in this thing called, we call life, I think trying to get an A, give yourself, be able to give yourself an A in all, all seven pillars That'd be awesome. Now, in reality, is it possible to do that every year? Um, no, it's it's uh, it's a very that's very difficult. And sometimes you strategically make a decision going into a certain year that you're going to focus on certain um, pillars. And um, but I think that's what we should all strive for. Yeah. Wow. Um. So amazing. You said so much right there. That's uh, very cool. Um. And yeah, I, I agree. The whole seven pillars thing. It's it's amazing. It's uh. You know, there's this self-help guru out there, kind of like Tony Robbins, Brendan Bouchard, and he talks a lot about categories and kind of keeping score, right? Hey, you know, this, today I was this, I was a five, or and how was I yesterday? And you with the seven pillars, it sounds like it's a good way, kind of a grading sheet, right? You're kind of grading yourself, seeing where you're at, tracking yourself. And I don't know if it was Tony Robbins or it could have been someone else, some other self-help guy saying, you know, if you don't measure it, Basically, how do you know that you're winning, right? How do you know that you're going forward mm -hmm. or going backwards? You have no idea. So it's, it's cool that you use the seven pillars as kind of your metric to see where you're at. Let me tell you something fun. You may not even know this. Um, so I've struggled. I, I, I always had this uh, fancy that I could be like an Adonis, like super fit, um, like a Greek god looking kind of individual. Are we still rolling? Is he talking? Is he really saying he's going to be an Adonis? Okay. First, first of all, I'm going to cut you off. There's people in the room like my our good friend Justin Lena who knows that's just absolutely not going to happen and it's a lie. But continue, anyways. I'm just kidding. No. Okay. Um, so I have, but I have this, I have this idea in my mind that I can get to this point. Yeah. And um, I seem to bite myself in the, you know, um, uh, and I, I don't achieve. And so I thought to myself, what can I do? So in my bed, in my closet. Um, I have a blown up calendar and I give myself a grade every day on my diet, an A, a C, or an F. And an A is if I eat clean and if I do sort of well, I get a C. And if I don't do so well, um, I get an F. And um, I started doing that about two years ago and with uh, Justin Lena's help who um, encouraged me to start getting in the pool and swimming. 
uh, I could say that I'm in the best shape I've been in the last 10 years. So if you get a C, what does that mean? Is that like you ate a bagel or something that day or – what, so my cr- I can eat. What's an F by yes. the way? Tell me what an F. An F means like. I I. So my my. <laughs> oh, is that a box of wheat thins at night with uh, a peanut butter I, trail? I, I love eating about? goldfish. So I have two <laughs> two young kids, and um, I will eat I will eat their crackers. I will eat their snacks. I will eat their gummies. Um, <laughs> And uh, that that is my downfall. So if I if I just do a little bit of that, I get a C. If I do that, if I do a lot of that, I get an F. Or if I do a little bit and I have an alcoholic beverage, I get an F. Mm. Luckily, we're drinking dry farm wines right now, so you can drink as much alcohol as you want, and you'll be fine. And I'm I'm enjoying it so far. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I want to go back real quick because we kind of jumped around. Back to the, that that first was that your first job being a Cutco salesman? I mean, it was actually my third first uh, sales job. First sales job. Yeah. Okay. When I look back to that job now, because you got me involved in that at 18, when I go back and I look at that job, I think that was probably one of the most impactful moves in my life. I was hesitant to do it, and there was some fear involved. You know, it wasn't the traditional job. There's a lot of, it's hard to sell, you know. We went out there, as you know, and sure, you in the beginning, you do your family members. Let's say 10 family members. But after that, you're doing cold calling. And cold calling is not easy. So when I, where I look at myself now in life, I think, holy cow, that experience at 18 made me so much stronger and better as a person. Like that, that allowed, that opened me up. I became more outgoing. The whole salesmanship, because it's such a difficult job and because cold calling is so difficult and you're getting a lot of no's and it's hard to stay on top of your game, the sales arena is surrounded by top performers like Tony Robbins, Jim Rome. We're following all those people Mm -hmm. to keep that positive attitude. So when I go back and I, again, when I go back and I think about getting that job at Coco, it was probably one of the best experiences in my life. What, what do you think? Oh, uh, that is one of three parts to a mix that I believe I have had a dream life. I mean, there's several, several ingredients that go into it, but I think if there's three core ingredients, um, I took those skills from selling Cutco kitchen knives. I blended it with some advice I got from my dad and some advice I got from a college professor and I was able to land three internships, my, like my dream internships. When I was in college, my, my junior year in college, the, I, was, I, was, um, I hadn't even thought about life after college. My professor said, and I, I minored in sports management. My major was communication. My minor was in sports management. And the professor said, who in the classroom would love to have an internship with a sports team this summer? Well, you can imagine every single hand went up. It was a, it was a class full of sports management students. And he said, um, well, I got good news. I have, I have five internships to hand out. Um, but then he said, the only fair way I know how to give out these internships is, is to the people with the best grades. Mm. So my head wow. went down. My shoulders shrunk. He had three classes of 60 students, and he was going to give it to the best – Best five students. I had all B's and C. I had mostly B's and C's in college, um, so I definitely wasn't one of the best students. But then he went on to say, "If you're not one of the best students, but you consider yourself hard a hard worker, come to my office hours, and I'll greatly increase your chances of landing an internship with a professional sports team, even if you have no um, no 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 contacts or no no connections." So I thought to myself, "That's me," because I had a paper route when I was thirteen. I worked at like Chuck E. Cheese type of place when I was fifteen, and then I had the had the sales job as a freshman. Um, and so that night, even though I had had job experience, I didn't even have a resume yet. So that hearing that was like the wake up call because in that same lecture, the professor said, "Hey, look, <laughs> you know, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, as you know, and they, you know, the professor called, hey, this is a bubble, like, what, you know, this is not normal.'" And um, you need to be thinking about life after college. And like I hadn't. And so that was my wake up call. And I'm so grateful for that, that class that day. Um, so the next day I showed up with my resume and I said, I, you know, I was just hungry, bright eyed, bushy tailed. Tell me what I got to do. I'm not afraid of hard work. I'm not aware, wait, re, afraid to step out of my comfort zone. Tell me what I need to do. Cause I'd love to be able to tell all my friends that I landed a, a job with or an internship with a professional sports team. 
And so we created this plan. And um, he basically said, you got to zig when others zag. And, um, you know, if you're just going to apply online, that's kind of like just buying a lotto ticket or crossing your fingers. Like monster.com. I don't even know if that's still around, but like, yeah. yeah. Career builder, indeed nowadays and, you know, handshake, whatever, you know, the flavor of the day was. And um, so he said, you got to do more than that. So we, we concocted this strategy where um, I'm from the Bay Area. So uh, we, we, he said, okay. And we, I was smart enough to realize that CEO, C-level types, they don't hire interns. Entry-level employees, they don't hire interns. It's that like mid-level director at these companies, um, with the, the people who have director in their title, that's usually the people who hire interns. So I made an Excel spreadsheet with six people at five different sports teams. So I'm not a hockey fan. So for those of you who know Bay Area sports, it, it was the um, – San Francisco 49ers, the Oakland Raiders, the San Francisco Giants, the Oakland A's, Golden State Warriors, but not the San Jose Sharks. <laughs> not a hockey yeah. guy. Yeah. And so um, I made this spreadsheet with six different – so the director of marketing, the director of finance, director of operations, director of community relations at all five of these teams. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do something that other students don't do. When other people are applying online, I'm going to go old school and I'm going to go snail mail. But I didn't just like you know take a piece of paper like this and I'm holding a, like a, a normal piece of paper. Um, and fold it up and, and, and put my resume on that. I was like, you got to be strategic. You got to do little things that make a difference. Huge. You got to stand yes. out. So I took my resume and my cover letter. I printed on cardstock, nice thick paper, like not resume paper, but like cardstock, thick paper. And then I bought oversized envelopes, like nine by 11 and a half or nine by 12, whatever they are, Manila envelopes. And then even to the detail, I didn't even use like a normal pen to fill out the the address. I got a, I got a Sharpie just so it looked more pronounced. And so if it showed up, um, a secretary or, or an assistant wasn't going to open it. it. You know, it would get opened by the person because it would look more personalized. Um, and so when I was strategizing this with my professor, I was like, okay, if we, if we do 30 of these and like, you know, it costs a little bit of money to buy 30 stamps, 30 big envelopes, go to Kinko's. Especially and, as a college kid. Yeah. And, and, and so, but luckily I had a little bit of money from selling the kitchen knives. And so I was, I was able to do that. But even if I didn't, I think it would be a great enough investment in what I'm trying to get to. Um, and so we sent out 30 of these, and I was thinking, like, I get five responses, right? Because I'm, I'm zigging when others zag. People aren't doing this. Yeah. Do you, guess how many responses I got? I still think from the sales world, it's a numbers game. So I still don't think – if I had to guess, I'd say your numbers still wouldn't be that great. I would say 50% on the high end, two-thirds. So I don't know, 50%. So yeah, no, no. I, I would have been thrilled with that. Zero. I got wow. no responses. Okay. Yeah. And so like 10, go, 10 days go by and I get no follow-up. So I walk in with my shoulders slumped into my, into my professor's office, office hours and I go, no dice. And, um, and he said, yeah, I kind of expected that. I was like, wait, I thought you said like we should, you know, we, we would probably get like three or five. He's like, well, I was hoping for that, but it doesn't surprise me that you got no response. He's like, you know what you need to do now, right? And I was like, no. He's like, well, you got to call him. I was like, call him? <laughs> Call them. These are like iconic people in my eyes. Like these are business people with a dream job, and I'm a little old, pimpled faced, insecure college student. And you want me to call these people? But then he broke it down to me. He's like, Sean, you can't pick up the phone, dial a number, and then say, "Hello, this is Sean. I'm a student at UC Santa Barbara. I, I sent something in the mail to you. Did you get it?" He said, "He said you can't say that." I was like, "Yeah, I could do that." He's like, and then if they say yes, you should say, I was curious what would be the next step to pursue an internship. And if they say no, then you say, well, would it be okay if I send it to you via email? He's like, can't you do that? I was like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, obviously I'm very nervous about this. So for the next three days, I had 30 people to call. So I picked 10 people for the next three days. And I can still remember being in my dorm room or my, wherever I was living, I don't think it was a dorm, but um, it was, I was a transfer student, so I was like a transfer dorm. And I couldn't even sit down. I had to stand up and to make these calls. And then I just, I would call or email like once a week, for every week for these 30 people. And some people said, never call me again. Some people said, really? um, uh, you know, some people just never called me back. Some people said, you got to talk to HR. Some people said, call me next year. Some people said, call me next month, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but unless someone gave me a hard no, I just mixed up an email or a call once a week for these 30 people. And after about eight weeks, there was this one woman with the Oakland A's in the marketing department. Her name was Lisa Wood. And she said, you know, because I had told this woman, uh, I'll work one day a week. I'll work seven days a week. I just want to get my foot in the door. And uh, she's like, you know what, Sean? 
HR said that we couldn't have an intern, um, but you have clearly shown that this is really important to you. Um, I'd like to bring you in for two half days a week, and um, it will be it will be unpaid, so you have to be willing to do that, which was okay because I was still making money selling kitchen knives on the other days. It actually worked out tremendously. Um, and uh, But if you do a good job, I'll give you a letter of rec at the end of the summer, and you can put Oakland A's on your re- resume. And that was amazing. And so that's what, that's what happened, and that, that's what got my foot in the door. So – so now I started this business all because of this experience. So I ended up getting that internship with the Oakland A's. That led to an internship with the San Francisco 49ers, which was a dream internship above and beyond all dream internships because football is my favorite sport. And that internship with the 49ers was in the player personnel department. Luckily, because I went to community college, I took so many units because my dad wanted me to transfer. I was a hit on units. And this internship was during the winter. So I took winter quarter off from UC Santa Barbara. I moved back in with my parents. Um, intern for the 49ers. They gave me um, access to the weight room and my own locker in the employee locker room. Wow. Um, it was just incredible. They flew me in Indianapolis for the combine. Those of you who are sports fans, they gave me a stopwatch to clock every guy in the 40 yard dash who was in the, you know, in the, in college, get, you know, uh, being prepared for the draft that year. Amazing experience. And I also landed an internship with the San Francisco Giants. And those three internships led to a full time job with the Oakland A's after graduation. Real quick, didn't the 49ers originally say no to you? Didn't you get shut down by them yes. for an internship? Um, yeah. So, so this, this internship in the player to personnel department, um, I had talked to the guy several times. And because, you know, I'm, I'm doing an email or a phone call once a week for, for, you know, eight, 10 weeks. And this guy, every time I did a phone call, he would always pick up. 49ers, this is Drew. 49ers, this is Drew. And like caller IDs existed for a long time. So he knew that I was calling at some point, but he would always take my phone calls. And, um, the internship was during winter. And so, but the, but he, he told me that this is going to be a son or a daughter, a niece or a nephew, a next door neighbor. It's going to be someone close to the family because it's highly sensitive information. Mm. Um, because if this information gets leaked, to, uh, leaked to like, um, ESPN or something like that, it's all over the news. And so they said, um, you know, we've, everyone who's had this internship for the last 10 years has always been someone close to the family. So, <clears throat> um, after I received my internship with the A's, actually the last day of my um, internship with the A's was a historic day in this country, September 11th, 2001. Wow. I was driving into my last day and my boss called me and said, hey, Sean, um, you probably heard about that on the news. I said, yeah, it's, she's like, it's crazy. No one knows what's going, exactly what's going on right now. Um, we got you a cake to celebrate you and your internship, but I think you need to turn around. It's just chaos. Um, you know, why don't we get together when you come back for th- Thanksgiving and Christmas? I said, sure. Um, so she's like, I'll send you your letter of recommendation in the mail and, uh, over email. And then, and then, so I get back to school two weeks later, I'm on the quarter system. And, um, this guy drew with the 49ers who told me that this internship isn't available to anyone that's not close to the family. I call him and he, I said, Hey, um, I want to tell, share with them that I had proof of concept, uh, you know, a professional sports team who I had no connections with trusted me. And now I have a letter of recommendation. Um, do you happen to, have you, have you already found someone to, you know, fill the internship in, in, in the winter? And he said, no, we don't have anyone yet. I said, so this is where the Cutco came in big time again. So he says, uh, so I, I knew face to face matters so much more than a phone call phone call. You don't truly know someone, but yeah. when, when you can sit down face to face with someone and breathe the same air, it's a different dynamic. Right. And so I said, so I didn't even try to ask him too many questions on the phone. I said, you know what? I'm going to be driving home for Thanksgiving in a couple months. Would it be okay if I stop off the freeway um, and just put a face to the name? Because we had talked like three or four times at this point. Yeah, wow. And, he, and of course, he said, yeah, you know, how, how could you say some no to a simple request like that? And he, and he didn't, he, but he, he said, oh, I'm only going to give you like 15 minutes. I said, sure, no problem. So like two days before Thanksgiving um, in 2001, I show up. I go to the lobby and like I see the 49ers five Super Bowl trophies and I'm just excited to be there. And he walks down from his upstairs office and comes and greets me. And we ended up talking for 15 minutes and, you know, there was no promises. But he did say to me, if we do not have someone close to the family, I can't guarantee you the internship, but I can at least get you an interview. So I was like, great. That's all I wanted to hear. So fast forward um, to January, the 49ers lose to the Green Bay Packers in a playoff game in the wild card. On a Sunday, on Tuesday, I get a call from Drew saying, Terry Donahue, the general manager, would like to interview you for, for the internship. Holy cow. So keep in mind, you, I, I had no connections, right? I, I, was just, I just made this list of 30 people and started sending out you know, snail mail and then followed up with phone calls, which scared the shit out of me, but um, ended up you know, being the secret sauce, I think, in, in this situation. And so 
I, I get told I have an interview with the 49ers for this prestigious internship in player personnel. So I drove my ass up from Santa Barbara as fast as I could. I, I interviewed and like on the spot, I got offered a paid internship 40 hours a week. Um, I dream come true. It was just, just amazing. So much to unpack. And there were so many things you were saying. I wish I had a pen to write it down. So, um, what I, from that story, what I get is you did all the things that no one else would do. I think there's a quote by Jerry Rice that says, I'll do today what others won't do tomorrow. And it seems like that's the things you were zigzag, like your professor said, or I think it was your professor, you were, you were zagging while others were zigging. You definitely were doing other things. It reminds me to when it's funny that you said going out of college, you were not prepared. And I remember the same feeling. I was getting ready to graduate UC Davis. And I really felt like when I was growing up in school, I was just told, get good grades, Joel. And so that's what I did. And it's interesting now looking back and reflecting, the same thing happened to me in high school. Throughout my entire life from whatever, zero to grade eight and into high school, I was just told, get good grades. And that's what I did. I did my best. I went to school. For many years, I had a 4.0. When I got into high school, kind of drifted off. I don't know what happened. Maybe I found girls or something. And I, I wasn't getting the straight A's, but I got good grades. Then I remember senior year, I graduate from high school. All my friends are going to Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley. Do you know where I'm going? Nowhere. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it. I didn't know you were supposed to apply to college. I had no idea. My parents didn't tell me, and these aren't, my parents aren't stupid. They actually went back to school and got their degree online at Phoenix, which a lot of parents did at one point. So they would have known to, to tell me this, like you should apply to a college or something. I had no idea. And I had school counselor and stuff. I don't know. What was I doing in school? I had no idea. Eventually, I kind of figure out some things. I go to the JC just to kind of buy myself some time. And then I transfer to UC Davis. Well, history repeats itself. I didn't really learn from my high school experience. So now I'm getting ready to graduate UC Davis. I have a BA in poli sci, uh, international relations. And so my goal was to work for the FBI. And so what do I do? Literally, it's like I gra the day I graduate, what do I do? I go and I apply for the FBI. I think I even applied for an internship, like the same time, the same day I'm graduating. Looking back, I realize you're an idiot. Like you were supposed to be interning in college. So by the time you get out of college, that, that, that job is already set. And I didn't, I, I did not even know, like that world was not exposed to me. And so it's so cool hearing your story and you're the guy out doing all the little things. And you're the guy that's going above and beyond, making the face-to-face, -face, doing the snail mail, doing the follow-ups. Just like you said, the 10 calls. People, they must have known like someone's going to stop calling after one call, <laughs> maybe two. Give this guy three calls. You know, you always hear this fa famous sales quote, like after uh, five no's, you get a, you get a yes. The sixth one's going to be a yes. You did it 10 times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So real quick, what was the conversation in your head during that time? That What was the self-talk like in your head when you were going through that? So when I, at that time of life, I was very ex extrinsically motivated. I just wanted to have a job where I, when I graduated with a cool logo on my business card and to be able to make money. So I knew from if I could sell kitchen knives, I could sell sports, right? And, um, and that's what I cared about. That was my motivation. I wanted to tell all my friends that I, wor was, I worked for a sports team and I want to be able to make, make money. And so having commission and bonuses as a salesperson, um, I really liked that. So that, that, was, that was really the driver of it. Wow. And, 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 and so not – and because I could take no hearing no from – you know, people trying to, you know, try in my knife sales effort, I figured it's not a big deal of trying to get a job in here and no. Wow. Another thing I, so, and I want to talk about is my story and that I just told you about high school and, and, and after college. Do you, do you see that a lot in people entering the job market? Do you see the Joel 
Do you see the Joel Evans out there doing the same thing? Do you see that kind of, oh, yeah, well, afterwards, I'm just going to apply it, and then I should, that's what I do. I got a four-year degree. Here you go, Mr. Applier. Now I'm going to get a job. Is that kind of attitude still playing today in the job market? Oh, yes, and that's why I'm so I, – I, I feel lucky – that I get to start this business or that I've started this business called Launch Your Career. Yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about Launch Your Career? So it actually, is, the company started just over a year ago, but the origins of it go back to 2007. So I went back to school to get my MBA 2005 to 2008. In 2007, I did a study abroad trip to China and Korea. And on the plane flight to Korea, I happened to have dumb luck and I sat on the, I sat on the plane next to the dean of the business school. So it's a 13-hour flight. There's a lot of time to talk. And at the time, I'm still working, working full-time for the Oakland A's because it was a part-time MBA. And he says to me, hey, Sean, who hooked you up with your job? And I was slightly off- – I, I was slightly offended. I was offended. Like, hooked up? No, you have no idea, bro. I mean, I didn't say that. Like, in my head, I'm like, yes. you have no idea – what I had to do to land this, the internships that led to this job. And he's saying, who hooked you up? Because that's what people thought. If you got a job with a sports team, you must have known someone. And just, I said, like the, just like the whole thing, like you're not going to get in unless the royal family lets you in. Yes. And it, that story just blows my mind because you said, no, I don't care who the royal family is. I'm coming in around the back door. See that? Yeah. And there's, a, there's actually a great book called The Third Door. Um, and it talks about how some of the most famous, famous people, um, you know, there's always the front door. And there's always the back door, right? The front door, every, you know, people wait in a really long line to get in. And, and then there's the back door, the people have connections. But then there's this third door that people, like, you know, go down the alleyway, you know, stack up, you know, garbage cans on top of one another and figure out a way to crawl in the window to get in that, you know, get inside, right? And I imagine most people, the first door and the second door, that's, like, obvious to them. Like, of course, I'm going to try the first door and then I'll go out the back. No one is thinking about the third door. Yeah, and so um, I'm going to go a little out of order here, but so that and that's the reason I have the nonprofit called Empower Students to complement the the business launch your career because um, um, people so some people some some people who grew up in families they get taught by their family members that you know um, there's a there is a back door and some people just get in the back door um, and some people are lucky enough to have people to, you know to understand the hustle and tell you about the third door, but then some people don't. Um, some people just grow up in environments where they're not exposed um, to these ideas and like they don't even so you know there's this thing in life like you don't know what you don't know and that's especially true of college students who don't who are trying to get in jobs jobs in corporate America um, that um, no one in their family have ever experienced and so <clears throat> that's why it's so important to, to be able to teach the hustle part of it um, so yeah, just going back into, um, just the whole third door, like you were saying, I feel like a lot of people will just stop at the first door or the second door. Like they'll try those doors, but then the third door, like, I feel like most people aren't willing to go that extra mile. And when we talk about just looking at your career, like you, you, your, if you were to write a book, I think you would say 11 doors, like that'd be the name of your book, right? Like, I'm going to try this door, that door. I'm going to go out the window. Well, I am writing a book, and it will be due out in the fall of uh, 2020, so, so keep your eyes open. Um, what, what do you think? At, though- at a macro level, it's really about three things. It's about permission, guidance, and motivation. So the permission part is um, people don't know what they don't know. So once you give permission to students and you, you, you just teach this concept of, like, it's okay to, to, to cold email or cold call – and reach out to a, basically a stranger, if you want to put it in those terms, yeah. like a business professional for a company you'd like to work for. Um, and, and you, and, and a lot of fifty percent of the fifty percent of people like, oh, I can do that. Okay, I'm all about it, and I'm ready to go. But then fifty percent, the other fifty percent go, oh, I don't think that's for me. I can't do that. Right? Um, you know, I'm an introvert. I might not see that seem that way on this on this conversation right now, but. And even on the days that I teach, I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I get good night's sleep. On the days that I don't, I, I don't so much. But um, it's very draining for me to be in front, up in front of people. But I think to be successful in life, you have to, you have to learn to be somewhat extroverted because yeah. you – I mean, um, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor has a great quote, and she says um, – I'm going to paraphrase here – that you know, people, people don't like the idea of networking because it comes off as selfish um, – um, 
But to succeed in this world, you have to be known, be known by people. Mm. And she's right. And um, It's something I wrote in my notes, actually, was salesmanship. This idea of salesmanship comes off very sleazy and um, – you know, just kind of cheesy. Like, oh, I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't want to come off this sleazy way. But I think it's a pretty necessary skill, right? Don't you think? Like, this is something that I wasn't exposed to until Cutco and then being surrounded by people like you. Yeah, yeah. And it's a t- I think it's a highly underutilized skill. Would yeah. you say so? <laughs> so? Some of the most successful people I know don't even have college degrees. If you look at some of the most yeah. famous people, um, iconic people in our society, whether they're iconic or not iconic, some of the most successful. So it's not about the degree; it's really more about the mindset and it's the hustle and not not taking no for an example and and having a vision of what you want to accomplish in life and and just being tenacious to going about it. Now, it it can't be all motivation. Sure. There has to be um, there has to be some willingness for personal growth to learn new things and and to step out of your comfort zone. But those th- those things are are what matters way more. Um, so in, you know, in some aspects for some, um, industries, for some types of jobs, you have to have certain degrees, right? You cannot um, be a lawyer at one of the most prestigious law firms in the country. If you didn't go to a top tier law school and graduate in the top 5%, like there, there, there are some rules in society and some corporate sectors where there are like, like there's no ways around it and you can't, there is no, there are some scenarios where there is no third door, Yeah. but in most of life, there is a third door. Where do you think most people are getting it wrong? So let's go back real quick. You, you touched on it. You have recently just launched a new, new project, right, called Launch Your Career. Why did you, why did you pick? You, you kind of touched on two things. You talked about empowered students, which specifically is reaching out to those uh, more of the underprivileged, right? That's your nonprofit. But Launch Your Career, why did you create that? to pay forward what was given to me. So my life was changed based because of that professor as an undergraduate who gave me that wake up call. So I want to be able to give that wake up call to others and not, and not just the wake up call, but a step-by-step approach. So I have, um, trademark a process called the career launch method. So I unknowingly created, created this company 20 years ago when I was a college student. Yeah. And then I've had the opportunity as, you know, teaching as an adjunct and now as, as a, as a professor of practice at the university to help over a thousand students land the internships and jobs they want. So I've been able to um, refine this formula to be able to um, teach it to others for them to uh, implement. And it's, there's nothing more rewarding in life. I mean, uh, to, to get thank you notes from, from people who you've impacted um, and, and made a huge difference. Yeah. Where, uh, and kind of walk me through what is launch your career for people that don't know. I I know what it's about, but what are people, how, how does it work? Um, is it launchyourcareer.com? And then just kind of tell us about uh, some of the components that what, what would people learn if sure. they embark on this journey? The website's launchyourcareer.academy. And we're very student friendly, technology friendly. So it, ra- rather than, um, so, I mean, a year from now, you'll be able to get this information in a book. But from spending time and teaching college students, I know that you know video is ideal. And also, delivering things via text message has a much higher open rate than sending things over email. So we created a platform where it's micro-learning, meaning it's only 10 minutes a day for 28 days, and you get this coaching delivered via text message and email. So you can, you, you can get a, a link to your personalized account um, sent to you via text message and you can watch your 10 minutes of coaching and over 28 days you have everything you need to know and you get all the templates the strategies the articles the videos to reference um, you know and, and there's no expiration date on that um, and so you'll know exactly what you need to do to accomplish landing a job or an internship at the company that you want so people go into this program basically by the end of it after the 28 days you can't guarantee but you would say you more than likely you're prepared to land your dream job or land a job that you really want, right? I mean, that's kind of that's that's the goal. Yeah. So so in the United States, every year parents spend 1.1 billion dollars on SAT prep and SAT tutoring, and that money is spent to increase your child's chances of getting into certain colleges. And then parents spend 
a lot of money on tuition and room and board. So you're a parent. If you invested in those two things, and then you knew that there was a company that could, couldn't guarantee it, but they could greatly increase your chances of getting your son or daughter the internship or job that they want, wouldn't you invest in that too? 100%. And I think it goes back to and what's what we put our focus on, right? I did the SATs. I think I took it a second time and I scored maybe 20 points better, you know, but nobody's focusing on these kind of invisible skills, which I think your program is teaching, right? Yeah. And so, so we think the, so there's SAT prep. We consider ourselves in the career prep market and we think that's totally underinvested at this point. And, um, we're, we're glad to be in this space and, and to be able to help people land, land careers that matter to them because Going back to what I said earlier, the seven pillars in life, you know, career, career is one of the seven pillars. I agree. And that's why I wanted you on, because I think that is a, that's a part of happiness, right? That's a, that's, if you're, if you're in a, you know, part of like the pillars, you know, you're holding up the foundation of your house. If your career is not right or whatever you're passionate about, or your purpose in life, if that's not strong, then you're not going to be a high performer, right? Um, Sorry, I cut you off. I just I, that was on my mind as well. And that's I want people to know like that's that's why you're here, and I think it's so important. Um, so someone not taking your class, they don't wanna they don't wanna go through the 28 days. If you had to give just one hack, one recommendation, what do you think is the biggest mistake people entering the job market today are making? Ninety percent of people spend ninety percent of their job search time by applying online. But the success rate is only 3 to 5% depending on the industry. Think about that. 90% of people spend 90% of their time on something that has a success rate of 3 to 5%. Here's another thing that will blow your mind. Most people most people don't know this. And I feel like we're told or told to believe that if you were to, I have a job. I've had a job for 12 years. It's the same job, it's stable. If if you were to tell me, go out, Joel, and get another job right now, I would, honestly, I would go online. That's exactly what I would do. I'd go online, and i start looking up. I don't know. I mean, right? I think we're sold this idea like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do, right? You go online, you But look. did you know only 20% of jobs in the United States are actually advertised? 20%. So what does that mean? That means 80% of jobs, uh, uh, there's this hidden job market. And that's not all going to the royal family. 80% can't be going to the royal family. The, no. The, uh, it, goes to, it goes to the people who are in the know and do have connections yeah. and the people who hustle. And what's so rewarding about doing this work and, and teaching others this method is that once people understand that and the light bulb goes on, they have a similar experience to I. Can I tell you two quick stories? Please. Okay. And I'm thinking, have you noticed this too? And I want to touch on this. When people get their dream job or just a job that they really want to get and you help them get it. And like you said, they go through this, this 28 day process. I'm imagining to the, the, the people that they become afterwards, like, like you said, that light bulb moment, when that turns on, I got to imagine like that same confidence now goes into the next job and now they know how to get, it's a skill, right? It's a skill that wasn't, that they learned and now they, they're carrying it to the next job or to their, to their, to find their next mate or whatever. Yeah. And that's what's so is great. So yes, the, the outcomes that we produce is helping people land internships and jobs, but really we're increasing self-confidence and, and, and business communication skills that stick with them for the rest of their life. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that, yeah, that's the biggest hack, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing that you don't even know that you're getting at the end of it, at the end of the experience. Yeah, and I've been told this by so many people as I've been writing out the business plan and working on um, how we're going to brand and what words to put on our website. Um, I wasn't focused on that. I was always focused on the outcome, but but people have keep telling me, no, you, what you do is way more than that. It's yeah. not just about helping get a job. You're you're actually changing someone's DNA yes. on, on how they approach life. Yeah, so... Um, it's been very rewarding to hear that from so many others. Yeah, and when I checked out your website, and if you see like the people getting jobs too, just for people that don't know, it's these are high jobs, right? These are Google professional sports teams, uh, Google X or SpaceX. I can't remember, um, but these are not just. This isn't like I got I got my dream job at In and Out Burger. Not to say anything wrong with In and Out Burger, but you know these are these are some high paying jobs. So, yeah, yeah, tell but, us about. But, but the of, great thing about this, I mean, I was asked to fly down to Orange County three weeks ago and I spoke to a community college and, and within the community college, it wasn't 
19, 20, 21 year olds. It was, it was, it was students um, who were in their uh, continuing education. So a lot of the students in the room that I, that I was asked to speak to were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Wow. And they're looking to just find a job or a new type of job. And, but this, this, these methods and these techniques, they work for them too. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's really exciting because that, that was very, that wasn't something I was pursuing because I teach at a four year anniversary with most, mostly students in their early twenties. Um, but to have the opportunity and to see the results that students of all ages are getting by implementing this is, is, is great. So two, two quick stories. Yeah. So you mentioned you went on the website. So you, you've seen the faces of, of, of these two people. Um, so one student, Lydia, was in my, you know, went, through, went through my program, and she said in her mind, I think it'd be great to work for Google, right? And Google is an iconic company in this day and age, and um, a, lot of, a lot of people want to work for Google. And so um, I was telling a story. Actually, She was actually in my class, and um, I was telling a story one day about re- being recruited to a non uh, not, not to a nonprofit. I was being recruited to a, a startup. And the startup was invested by a guy named Tom Chi. Well, Tom Chi is one of the co-founders of Google X. So within Google, there's this uh, entity called Google X, and they do the big, hairy, what they call the BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals. And so they're putting satellites over Africa to be able to provide internet service to parts of Africa. I mean, they're, they're, they're working on you know, just really um, outlandish um, goals. And so um, I had just mentioned this guy's name once. Tom Chi about being recruited to a company that he invested in. And so Lydia was sitting in my class and she said to herself, Oh, I think it'd be great if I could, if I could do a, you know, an informational interview with, with, I like to call it a career conversation with Tom Chi. So one of the assignments I have in my class is everyone has to do a two of these and they have to do them in person. So she, and we teach this method. It's a mixture of phone calls, emails, and we try not to use LinkedIn messages because a lot of business people get turned off by just trying to send a LinkedIn message to someone. Um, but we ha- we have this methodology that we use, and she she go she uses it, and she she gets a, she gets him to say yes, I will take a meeting, and he says, you know, I I work in San Francisco, can you get here? If not, we can do it by phone. And she said, you know what, I can I can get there. Um, it was about an hour drive for her, but she she made it, and so we teach about what to wear, what to bring, what to say, how do you make small talk, what's questions mm, to ask, so critical. And then once you, you know, as you're in this career conversation or, you know, you're, you're meeting this stranger for the first time and you're, you're truly genuinely interested in their, in their job and their career, how do you selfishly at the end of it transition to asking about an internship or a job? And so we have strategies on, in a, in a, in a formula on how to do that. And she executes it. And at the end of it, he goes, unfortunately, no, we don't have any internships, um, which was okay. Because the thing is, um, in life, and you, and you know this, is the job interview or a lot of times the actual interaction is only half of it. Yep. Your follow-up is just as important as, as the actual meeting. And so we, we teach a four-step process in the follow-up. Sending a thank you email, that's expected. Yeah, um, everybody does. You got to do more than that. So we teach three more things you need to do to keep a relationship alive um, and to leave it in good condition. So um, part three of that formula is um, checking in a month later either be email or a phone call. And I always encourage, encourage the phone call because millennials and now Gen Z, they have a, yep. um, a stereotype of, of not wanting to get on the phone. Yeah. Um, so she, she, so she, she knows that she wants to stand out. So she calls Tom because he gave her a business card and his phone number's on it. And she, he doesn't pick up, but she, he leaves a message. He calls her back and says, hey, Lydia, great timing. I actually just invested in a company. I know you're an accounting major. We need someone to build out an accounting program for one of the startups I invested in. You would report directly to me, but you would be working for one of these startups. What do you think? <laughs> it's just huge. So this student had no connection to anyone at Google, let alone Google X. Happens to hear this one guy's name, figures out his email address through a process that we teach, and sends him an email, gets a yes to a meeting, executes the meeting well, more importantly, executes the follow-up well, yeah. and then lands a paid internship. Can you believe, can you imagine what it was like for Lydia to call her mom and dad and to say, I, I have a paid internship with the co-founder of Google X? She had no connection. Second story, Kevin Singh. Kevin, an introvert, way more of an introvert than me. Um, also, Kevin has a learning disability. He, he, has a, um, he has a pronounced stutter, or he did at the time. And he, he says that my career coaching helped him improve his stutter, which I don't believe, but I'll, I'll take the compliment. Um, so Kevin, he, uh, had, was getting a degree in a certain major, but he didn't want to go into that field. 
He was just doing it because that was what he signed up for. But he changed his mind on what he was interested in. In his mind, he thought he want, he, he really wanted to be a sports agent. So um, he, we do, one of the first steps we do in our, in our program is we make a top 10 list of the companies you like to work for. And so he, on his top 10 list, he has the agency for Tom Brady. So for, for those of you who aren't sports fans, Tom Brady is the quarterback of the New England Patriots, uh, all-time winning. And he, he might be considered the greatest football player of all time. Well, his agent is a guy named Don Yee, and who, who, um, has an, you know, who works out of L.A. So on Kevin's top 10 list is this company called Yee and Dubin. And so, um, we te- so one of the strategies that we teach is email, email, phone call, email. And you spread it out three days apart. So Kevin sends, and we give the exactly what to put in the email, what to put in the subject line, what to, what to put in nice. the body, exactly what you put in, how you have to have your email signature. Um, and so he sends email number one, no response. Waits three days, sends email number two, which is a shorter email, um, gets no response. The next step in the process is to make a phone call, which most students get scared about and never make. Um, and they just give up. But Kevin didn't. He actually took the coaching and three days later he made a phone call. So he calls, he gets to the, you know, we don't, we don't have any secret potion to get someone's cell phone number or direct line. You just get the main line. You call the receptionist and you ask to get transferred to the person. So he calls, he gets transferred. He leaves a voicemail for, for Don Yee. Didn't pick up, but he left a voicemail. The next day he gets a call back from Don, not Don's assistant from Don. And he says, Kevin, I received your two emails. I also got your voicemail, um, and I'd be happy to meet with you for an informational interview. As you may know, I, I work in L.A., and I know you go to school in the Bay Area, so if you want to do this over phone or video chat, that'd be fine. But if you can make it to L.A., I'd be happy to host you here. Wow. And, Kevin, and Kevin is um, some of Im- immigrants. His parents immigrated to this country from Vietnam and uh, worked at a donut shop. Seven days a week, his parents worked. They weren't the owners of the donut shop. They were just employees of a donut shop. His dad would wake up at midnight every night to go put the you know, donuts in the oven. And his mom would um, wake up at 3 to get to work at 5 so she could start serving customers wow. um, to provide for a better life for him and his sister. And Kevin, says, Kev, Kevin had an uncle who actually also worked at a donut shop in Riverside. And who had, you know, so he said, I, you know, Don, yeah, actually, I can make the drive to L.A. I have an uncle who, works, who lives in Riverside. I'll spend the night there, and I'll drive back the next morning. So Don says, yes. Don Yi is so impressed that Kevin made this effort and then conducts himself well during the information interview that he left his informational interview. He left there, met the, just met the guy. He left there with a paid internship, a summer internship. Um, it's just amazing stuff. Can you imagine what it was like for Kevin to drive home and call his mom and dad and say, I just landed a paid internship with the agent for Tom Brady? I mean, that's, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm just smiling because I'm just thinking of just the story and just, just his family background and just, you know, how so many people could maybe in his shoes could just think that's impossible. I could never get that job. And these soft skills or these invisible skills that you're teaching, you're getting, you're helping people reach that, that, you know, that area in their life, that, um, that fulfillment that might have thought, you know, there's just no way of obtaining. Um, just such a cool story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I and the, and the co- cool part about yeah. both those students I just mentioned, first generation college students. Wow. They, 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 didn't, they didn't, you know, um, until they had, heard, they didn't know what they didn't know. Of but course. as soon as they learned what was possible and they weren't afraid to step out of their comfort zone, amazing things happened. So cool. Um, we're getting a little long in the tooth, so I want to I want to wrap it up here. But I got just a couple ending questions for you. You're a high performer. I think you are. What What's like one practice, or is there a daily practice that you have that you do? Whether it's I don't know gratitude journaling or just journaling in general, or is there a mobility prep? Is there something that you do on a daily basis? Some kind of habit or hacks that you like to employ daily that you feel are just a game changer for you and maybe or maybe even something like that that you think you're surprised that other people don't do it because it has such a yeah. profound impact in your life uh, your your word gratitude hit, hit it on the point so i i believe so i have a lot of flaws i believe whatever success i've had is because early and often in my career 
I had three attributes um, that set me apart. I was accountable. Um, I was grateful. Um, and I was tenacious. Um, and uh, gratitude, I think, is the most important. Um, so I believe in a higher power, and I and, and I am grateful for the fact that I was born into a situation. In, in, I was born in the United States. So let's just th- think of it there, right? So United most States, people, white male. Like you hit the jackpot, as Gary Vee would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, and, and you know, most of the people who listen to, listen to this podcast probably live in the United States. Um, but where, wherever you're listening to this, there are so many people born into poverty, and we are so lucky to live where we just wherever you are in the United States to, to be to be able to live here, right? Um, and then for me to be able to have the um, the coaching and the teaching and the environment that I've had and the experience that I've had at a young age, um, I'm very grateful for that. And so that's why I took a huge pay cut um, three years ago to um, do what I do. I had a very successful job in industry and, um, but I believe that there is something, I have this gift that I received from my college professor that not enough people have, and there aren't enough people doing what I'm now doing. And so it would be a shame for me not to be doing what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, I think gratitude is the biggest thing. So yes, um, I don't, Journal. I goal set. I do a lot of goal setting. Um, I, I I do some meditation. Um, it's very important. Uh, fitness. I know you're big into fitness. Um, uh, morning fitness. I think that's a great routine. Getting up early, getting a workout in, and getting that um, getting that perspective is really important. It's so cool you said gratitude because it's Thanksgiving Day that we're recording this. So how apropos. I love it. Um, last question for you. Any books that you would recommend? I don't know, one to three books. What are your top three books? It, can, it doesn't have to be three. It could just be one. But what are your top three books that come to your mind that you're like, people should read these? Yeah, so that there's a great book life. on mindset by David Goggins. And um, former Navy SEAL, um, ultra marathoner, and the things that he's been through. I mean, he, he just, if, if, if you want to expand what you think is possible, Read the. Well, I listened to the book. Um, yeah, I, I have the I book actually, on audio too. Yeah. It's great. Um, audio audio books is the way to go for me. Um, that that book just um, really um, opened my perspective. When I was a college student, there's a book you mentioned earlier in this uh, in the conversation. Jim Rohn, um, seven um, set of, seven strategies for wealth and happiness. That was um, something that opened my eyes as a teenager. That 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 was a game changer. Yeah. Thank you. And then. Um... Last thing, where can people find you? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn at uh, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Sean O'Keefe, S-E-A-N-O-K-E-E-F-E. Um, connect with me there um, or um, uh, join our community at launchyourcareer.academy, launchyourcareer.academy. Awesome. And people can find you. You also do speaking and stuff, right? Yes, another website called superiorstudentoutcomes.com, superiorstudentoutcomes.com. Awesome, man. Thanks for uh, being here on the podcast. This was awesome. Great to be here. Thank you.